Hi folks, it's been a while since I've did one of these. This is going to be a programming tutorial for Next Basic on the ZX Spectrum Next. So I did a programming tutorial a couple of years ago that some of you might remember where I taught some Z80 assembly language using the game Connect 4 as an example. We created Connect 4 in Z80. So that proved to be quite a useful way of learning that language. So let's see how it fares with uh, Next Basic, and in particular, uh, getting hardware sprites working. So let's begin. First thing you want to do is create some sprites before you get into Next Basic. So there's a handy sprite editor built into the operating system. First thing you want to do is go into the browser and point it at the place where you want to store your program and your sprites. So that might be just in the, the root folder here, C. But I've got a little subfolder called Progs, and that's where I'm going to put it. So don't worry about the files that are already lying there. You're going to be starting from scratch. So, press break to go back to the menu, and then go into the command line. I haven't experimented very much with the command line yet, so the only one that I've really used is the dot command, which is dot spor edit, sprite editor, in other words. And you want to tell it the file that you want to create. Just call it connect4 and end it in .spr because it's going to be a sprite file. So if that file already exists, uh, it can use it. But if it doesn't exist, it will create it from scratch. So here we go. It already, it already exists in my case, but because I haven't loaded it yet, it actually won't come up. So let me just break out of this a second. Um, symbol shift space to quit. Just go back to the browser. I'm going to load in my existing sprite file, connect4.spr. If I just press enter, it'll launch it in the sprite editor. Okay, so this is what I want you to create in the sprite editor. Five sprites, as you can see here. Just ignore the other ones, they're, they're there by default. So create a yellow counter, a red counter, just like the game. Then uh, a blue empty slot, and then a blue slot filled with a yellow counter and a blue slot filled with a red counter in this specific order. Um, I hope you can see this clearly enough uh, on the graphics, but there's quite a bit of shading has gone into things here. So give, give your graphics a little bit of nuance. Yeah. And feel free to make the counter larger than the hole. As you can see, that's what I've done. The hole is actually slightly tighter than the counter itself. Now the important thing I have to tell you about is the transparency. It's this color right here, which is selected by default. You want to fill the outer area as a transparency and also this area here as a transparency. If you don't do that, uh, things aren't going to work because we want to be able to see the counter pass underneath when we begin to program it. Okay, so remember this order. Create your own sprites and then save them with Shift S. Saving. All good. Press any key to continue. And now what I want to do is break out of the program with symbol shift space. All the instructions are here. You can cycle through them by pressing J. It's a fairly easy little editor to use. And when you have saved your sprites, they will appear as a file called connect4.spr in your desired folder. Okay. Now let's go back to the menu. Whoops, I pressed the wrong thing. I always press edit instead of break. Sometimes an edit takes me back a folder. I want to stay in this folder. Okay, press break to get to the menu. Now we go into next basic. Now we're actually going to begin creating our program. So let's just fill it out with some appropriate RAM lines. So the first thing we want to do is bring in our sprite data. So let's put a remark about that. Import sprite data. 
And here's how we do that. Right, line 30. Load, speech marks, connect for dot SPR. So far you're familiar with the syntax, yeah, if you've used Sinclair Basic before. But because this is more than just a 48k machine, we better tell it exactly where we want to put that file. And the full megabyte of memory is actually split up into separate banks because you can't have more than 64k in a single bank. It might even be less than that, I'm not sure. Because I have no real experience with using the 128k machines, just the 48k back in the day. But in my case, I'm going to throw the data into bank 16. I'm picking that number fairly arbitrarily. Uh, just you can pick whatever bank you want. I'm not sure what the particular limits are on what the highest bank is, but I'm going to use bank 16. So I could leave it at that and that would work just fine. But I'm going to add a couple more parameters to the end of that. I'm going to do Right, bank 16, comma, zero. Zero being the beginning address in bank 16, right? Because all addresses are numerically assigned. So starting at address number zero in bank 16, for a total of 1,280 bytes. That is specific to 256 times five. There are five sprites each sprite has 256 bytes associated with it, so the total sprite bank of five sprites is 1280 bytes long. So that's what that line means. Now, it's not really a bank of sprites yet. It's just bank 16 of the memory contains all that data that, was, that is going to eventually become sprites. But at the minute, it's just data. So what we want to do is... We want to load the contents of bank 16 into the hardware sprites. And we do that with the instruction sprite bank 16. Everything you do with sprites begins with an instruction that starts with the word sprite. Okay, So that's not doing anything to bank 16. That's loading the contents of bank 16 into the hardware sprites. All right. Now I'm going to do sprite clear. That's not entirely necessary, but what it does is, if you, if you happen to have a previous game loaded in that had hardware sprites active, sprite clear will clear them from the screen because unlike basic where the screen would clear as soon as your program listing comes back up, the sprites don't clear themselves automatically. You could load one program over another and the old hardware sprites will still be visible. So sprite clear turns them all off. And then we want to follow that with sprite print one. That just, make, that just means that the sprites are printable. Uh, you either have a one or a zero on that. If I were to type sprite print zero while my whole program was running, all the sprites on the screen would just suddenly vanish. And then I could do sprite print one and they would all just reappear. Okay. So that's a handy command, but it has to be set to 1 for anything to be done with sprites. Okay, that's the sprites loaded in. Let's just test our code. It won't do anything yet, but it should load the sprites into memory. Okay, success. Okay, so now let's go to, say, line 200. And we want to set up the board. Now, uh, first thing we want to do is actually get a sprite on the screen. So let's say line 240. Sprites are numbered from 0 up to, I presume, 63 because there are a total of 64 sprites available. I'm going to choose sprite 1. Um, there's a reason why I'm not choosing sprite 0 and we'll get to that later. I'm going to start the board with sprite 1. So, let's just get something on the screen to get an actual sprite visible. There are five parameters you have to cover here. The first one is the number of the sprite. The second one is the X position on the screen, the horizontal position. Let's just do zero. Next one is the Y position, vertical. Let's do zero. So this should be the top left of the screen. 
The next parameter is what particular pattern you want to put on the sprite. Now the difference between a sprite and a pattern uh, are, is this. When we were in the sprite editor, we were not actually creating five sprites, although I called them sprites at the time. They're actually just five patterns labeled zero through to four. So pattern zero is the yellow counter. Pattern one is the red counter. Pattern two is the empty slot. So I want pattern two because that's part of my board. And the final parameter, we can either just do zero or one on it. Zero turns it off, one turns it on. So that should get me a sprite on the screen. And let's just see what happens. Right. What have I done wrong? I'm not getting anything at the moment. Ah! I know what it is now. <laughs> the sprite has actually printed uh, outside the border of the screen. Uh, something I forgot. So if, let's say if I put something like 50 and 50. There we go, it's on the screen now. So this is interesting. The Spectrum originally has a, has a, it's a the, the screen you're looking at at the moment is known as layer zero. It's the original Spectrum display and it's 256 pixels wide. But the sprite display range is actually uh, 320. And when it reaches the border, it actually disappears behind the border. You can set it so that it will go over the border, but it obviously it obviously defaults to being behind the border, and the border is white in this case. You can't really see it, but it's there. There's a, there's a white border. Um, I can I should actually turn the border maybe to green, say border four, and there you can see where the border actually is. So I'll show you I'll show you the sprite's behavior by actually giving these values something like um, something like 12 and 12. That should show me the sprite peeking into the screen from behind the border. And maybe I haven't gone far enough. Let's try something a little higher. There it is. You can just about see it. Bring it in a little bit more. There we go, it's almost on the screen. So that's what was going on there. Right, good. Sprites are working. Now let me just turn the border back to back to normal again. Border seven. There we go. So we don't want to we don't want to put our sprite there. We want to draw a board that is seven cells, seven slots wide by six deep. And we want to make sure it's in the middle of the screen. So how do I work that out? Well, each slot is 16 pixels wide, because that's what these sprites are by, by default, 16 by 16. There are seven of them. So 16 times seven is 112. The screen is 320 pixels wide. 320 minus 112 is, duh, 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 duh. I can't work it out. I'm gonna consult my notes here, but Basically, we need to have 104 pixels here at the left-hand side. Then we have our board, which is 112. And then we have another 104. And that should make 320. <laughs> so, I want my sprite to be at the X position, 104. And I'll pick the Y position. I don't have to be too careful about it, but I'll do 88. And I'll just stick to multiples of 8 because I'm used to doing that from working with UDGs. Uh, that should get me the first one exactly where I want it. Yeah. So if I want a second sprite beside that, I could do sprite number 2. And we have to add 16 to that. So that would be 120. Still on row 88. Same pattern and visible. Should get a second sprite now. There we go. Now I could continue like that, but obviously there's a more efficient way to do it by doing a for next loop. So let's get rid of line 250 and let's do, do it like this. For x equals 104 to 200 step 16. Hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And I don't want to, I want to show my sprite up position X. And then that should get me a row of seven sprites going 104, 120, 136, 152, 168, 184, and 200. Right. Now that's interesting <laughs> because we actually got an animation there. Did you see that? It was very fast. We got an animation, we didn't get a row of sprites. It's really, really quick, but if I add a pause statement in, you can see it animating. One second. Um, two, four, five. Pause 10. Uh huh. Didn't mean to get an animation going, but that's what we got. So let's get rid of that pause. Of course, I know why it happened. I'm placing sprite 1 in all the positions, but I really need it to be sprites 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So I need to introduce a counter. So let's say line 210, let i equal 1. And instead of being sprite 1, we do sprite i, and then we will add 1 to i every time it goes through the loop. There we go. Now that should give me a row of sprites. There we go, exactly. But we need six rows. So let's do another loop, a loop within a loop, to try and get some more rows going here. So line 220 for y equals 88 is my first row, and 168 will be my last one. And yes, I am referring to some notes here, in case you're wondering. Um, and we want that to be at position number Y. Next X, next Y. A loop within a loop. Okay, our board is complete and it's looking well. And we're using a total of 42 sprites. There are a maximum of 64, I believe. There might be some way around that, but at, at the moment, as far as I know, there are 64 spr sprites that you can have on the screen. So I was thinking I needed an individual sprite for all these cells, and that left me in, in problems because uh, I'm already using 42. 42 plus 42 is 84, and I'm not allowed that many sprites. But I found a way around that, as, uh, as we'll get to. There may, there may be other ways to do this. You could use a tile map, possibly, to, to draw the board, but I haven't investigated tiles yet. Someone's also going to tell me off for not using uh, integer variables. Integer variables look like this. Okay, and they're much more efficient and they're faster, but they're just a pain to type. And it's something that I'll it's something that I'll do to the program after I've completed it. So for the time being, I just want to introduce sprites, and everything else will just be standard spectrum syntax. Okay, so our, our board is complete. Now we want to show the player sprite. So line three hundred, ram, set up player sprite. So it's just another sprite command. This time we're going to use sprite 0 as the player. You'll remember that I started the board at sprite 1. So sprite 0 is the player. And we want to position the player at horizontally 152, vertically at 72. And we want to use pattern 0, which is the yellow counter. And we want to switch it on with a 1. So that should get me my player on the screen. And there he is. There we go. Okay. Now to get a game going. So I'm going to need some variables to make a game work. So initialize variables. So let's see what we need. We're going to need, there are seven columns. So we're going to need to keep track of Hang on a second, I've lost my notes because the screen saver kicked in and there's a password protection on it. Right, here we go. Um, we're going to need to keep track of where the player is, in not just in terms of where the sprite is, but actually which, 
column the player is hovering over. So there are seven columns. I'm going to use the variable p for the player and what column he's hovering over and the middle column would be 4 so we're going to call that 4. Right. And we need to keep track of the actual sprite which is different from that. So the sprite is going to move one pixel at a time and its x value we're going to set to 152 which is just the same as what I've done in line 310. Okay, But we know that's not going to always stay at 152 so we're going to use a variable so that we can adjust that later. The player is going to change color throughout the game or rather it's a two player game so the color of the player is going to change from yellow to red and back to yellow so we'll use a C variable to track the color. So we'll use 0 to represent yellow and we will use one to represent red. Uh, we don't have to stick to the conventions that were there with the Spectrum's original color pal palette where red was two and yellow was six. It's a lot, a lot easier just to forget that and move forward with uh, a simple, simpler sort of way of doing it. So there's our initial set of variables. Um, we may need some more later, but that'll do for now. Right, now we want to invite the player to move. Invite player movement. So typical keys, O and P for left and right and space to drop the counter. If in key string equals speech marks O then and I'll simply go to a subroutine for this which I will store a little bit further down at say line 700. So line 620 then in key string equals speech marks p go sub 800 there's probably a quicker way I can do this I can just rename the line to and then adjust it there we go that's faster so a subroutine at line 700 for left 800 for right and 900 for drop the counter and I also want to do something that allows me to start the game afresh. So R for restart. And all I need to do to restart the game is to go back to the beginning. Now I don't need to reload the sprites. But so I'll go to line 50 rather than going to the very beginning. There we go. So R to restart the game. And the last thing I need to do then is just to loop, loop back to line 610. So I'll send it into a go to loop so that it's constantly scanning for those keys. Okay, good. So as soon as I press O, it should end the program. Yes, with the key press. Now let's, uh, let's work out what happens when, when left is done. So 700, move left. So the first thing we want to do is move that sprite 16 pixels to the left and we want to, we can do that with a little for loop or i equals 1 to 16 and the player's x position is where the player is tracked horizontally we want to take one away from that and then we want to redisplay the sprite with the new coordinates. So it's just a case of putting the sprite instruction in again. Sprite 0, position x horizontally, still 72 vertically, that's not going to change. Uh, I don't want to just do 0 for the color because that means it'll always be yellow. I know I did that above if you look at line 310 but that's just for the start of the game. The color is going to change throughout the game, so we're using the variable C to track that. So we want a C to be in there. And it's always going to be a 1 at the end, because that means the sprite is visible. Okay. Now we want to end that for loop. 
and since we're using the variable p to track where the player is, we want to not forget to take one away from p. So on the first move, the player will move from column 4 to column 3 by taking one away from p. And finally, we just want to return back into the section that allows for player movement. So that should be left working. Let's try it. There we go. It's working pretty fast. I think I must have the megahertz quite, li quite high. Let's, uh, let's just change those. Yeah, it's at 14. Let's put it back to the standard 3.5. There we go. Let's try it again. There we go. Now, there's something I need to be careful about because I have a feeling... Yeah, I can just keep going off the edge. I don't want that. I want it to be able to stop at the edge. So that's pretty easy to implement. Um, I basically want it to stop uh, when it's at the first column, when P is 1 in other words. So line 7, 10. If P is 1, meaning if you're already in the first column, do nothing. So return back from where you came. So that should stop, stop the counter at the left hand side of the board. Let's test it. Perfect. Won't take me any further. So implementing the right hand side is just the same code repeated. So I'm just going to rename these lines and then I'm going to adjust them accordingly. Okay, so 800 is move right. If P equals 7, then return, because 7 is the right hand side. Again, it's a, it's a loop of 16, but we want to add 1 to X this time, because we're moving to the right. And we want, we want to add 1 to the player's position, because he's moving over a column to the right. And that should be P for right implemented. Perfect. Working just fine. So the next thing is to drop the counter in. So that's line number 900. Now, we have a bit of a problem here, first of all, in that I have no way of tracking how far down the counter drops. I can program it to drop down six and that'll work for all these rows but as soon as I drop another one it's going to drop down six so I need it to drop down five if there's a counter already there, four if there's two counters there. So what I'll do is I'll introduce a variable for each of these columns and every time you drop a counter the variable will start at six, 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 six meaning six available drop slots. Every time a counter drops one is taken away from that, meaning there's five remaining until it gets to zero and you can't put any more in. So that's how we'll do that. I'm going to need a new variable for that. So I'll go back up to my variable definition section, which is, yeah, line 510. So I want 520. I'm going to set up a simple array. We'll call it B for board. And there are seven columns. Uh huh. B bracket seven. Now, I need to very quickly put six in all of those. I could just write six. I could just do let B brackets one equal six, let B brackets two equal six. But we'll do a simple for next loop to accommodate that. Let B brackets I brackets equal six next I. Okay, that ought to do it. That creates my array of seven elements uh, and it fills them with six. Okay, that's good. 
Now I'm ready to make use of that when we drop our counter. Right, the first thing we want to check is if there are no drop slots available in the column that the player is in, then do nothing because there's no space to put to put anything. So 910. If B brackets what? Well, zero one it's gonna be one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven. So it's the one that the player is on. So it's B brackets P. If that equals zero meaning if there are no drop slots available, then simply return and do nothing. Okay, failing that, the little subroutine goes on. Now I want to make my sprite descend. So this time I'm going to introduce a Y variable. And we're going to set it to the start position of the counter, which is up at 72. That's exactly above the board. All right. Now we need a for next loop to make the counter descend. So for i equals one, two. Now I can't just do. Let me think. Right. B brackets p. Right. So if you if there are no counters in that column whatever column that is. That's, so that's going to be 6. That's going to be for i equals 1 to 6. But that's only going to move 6 pixels. <laughs> that's no good. Uh, we need to actually multiply that by 16 because every sprite is 16 pixels tall. So that's the correct expression to actually make the counter descend the correct number of pixels. Okay. We want to add one to the y variable then every time it goes down so that we can track its position. And then we want to display the sprite as it's descending. So again, it's always sprite zero. The counter is always zero. Even when it changes color to red, it's going to be zero. So x and y, color c, visible. 960. Close off my loop. Okay. That will work. Um, there's a few more things to do. So let's just test that this is working so far. I want to close off, make sure I come back. But there are a few more things to do. So let's run that. And there it is descending. But it's not quite working yet. Okay? <laughs> it is working to an extent, but there's a few more things to do. Right. So, line 970. Uh, we need to take one away from the available slots in the column. So our, our little array B with P in it for the player position, uh, take one away from it. So it's BP equals BP minus one. All right. And then we want to do, all right, let's test that. I know it's only a small change, but it should start to creep up the columns. Yes, even though we've only got the one sprite so far, it's actually working its way up correctly until it gets to the top, and then it should just not work. But the other columns should still be, yeah. Okay. So the last thing I need to do then to make this work, well, there's a couple of things still to do. I need to permanently place my sprite down so that it doesn't disappear. So the way, the way I thought to do that was, instead of introducing a lot more sprites, when this sprite hits the bottom, change the actual visible sprite of that board piece to the one that shows the yellow piece inside 
the the blue slot, which was uh, that would be sprite number zero one zero one two three. Okay, so pattern number three is the blue slot with the yellow counter. Pattern number four is the blue slot with the red counter. So we need these are all currently number two. That's is two two pattern two 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 two. So we're going to use three and four now. That's how we'll do that. Okay, 980. Now this is a little bit convoluted, but I had to do a little bit of mathematics to work this out. Um, okay, that. <laughs> uh, you see, the thing is, we have an array here that is it's just a single one dimensional, well, the sprites are just numbered 1 to 42 for the board. They're not stacked in any kind of array that is, uh, they're not stored in any kind of array that's two dimensional that allows me to reference it. So I have to find a way of finding, you know, let's say sprite number 35, where is that on the actual screen? So. That little piece of mathematics there allows me to track exactly where the correct sprite is um, based upon the knowledge that I know what P is and I know what B is. So that actually, it works. It took me a little, little while to figure that out, but that little piece of mathematics works. So X and Y position as normal. Uh, now this time we don't want to place the counter down like that. It's not C, it's it's gonna be C, it's gonna be three plus C, okay? Because C at the beginning of the game is zero, but we want to get pattern number three. So it has to be uh, zero plus three to get me to pattern three. But if the color is red, that means C is one. We're gonna do that in a moment. C is one. I wanna to get to pattern four. So that would be three plus one, okay? There we go. And the last thing we need to do is, well, I'll run that first. So that should make my sprite permanent, and it does. There you go. But unfortunately, they're all yellow. So the last thing we need to do is swap the player to red. And it's not too hard. So 990, if C, if the color is zero, which is yellow, then change it to red, which is one, else, change it to yellow. We need that else in because if it already is red, we need to change it back to yellow. That seems to be the most efficient way of doing that. And that, believe it or not, is our program complete. Well, let's test it. O and P. There we go. It's really nice for the first time ever seeing smooth moving graphics in BASIC because those of you that programmed this back in the day, <laughs> you know what it was like with UDGs and how they could move. They had to move eight blocks at a time unless you were some really proficient programmer. There was nothing in the language that really facilitated this kind of movement. It is nice and smooth. That does seem to be the maximum sort of speed you can get out of BASIC, uh, just what you're seeing at the moment running at 3.5 megahertz. Uh, so nothing's gonna move faster than that, except of course I could skip two pixels at a time and that would speed it up. Um, and also using integer variables would probably speed it up. Uh, let's just test uh, the higher megahertz. Let's go to seven. Yeah. 
That's nice and nippy, I like that. And of course we can go right up to we can go right up to 28. So there you go. So that shows you the kind of speed that you will be able to get out of your basic programs. <laughs> it's a little hard to control, but of course I can slow down the control aspect of it in some fashion. And that's just to test that our R works to restart the game, and it does. Very good. So obviously I haven't programmed it. Anything that allows the player or that allows the computer to detect when someone has won the game, but of course all that's possible. This is just a, a basic introduction to, to get you familiar with sprites, how they move, and a little bit of rudimentary collision detection. The one thing that I didn't mention was, uh, let me just put this back to regular megahertz. There we go. I didn't mention the fact that I chose uh, sprite zero specifically for the player. The first time I tried to program this, uh, my counters were floating in top of the board. And it turns out that whether a sprite goes in front of, of another sprite is all determined by the numbering of the sprite. So because the number zero is less than any of the other sprite numbers, it will always go behind that sprite when moving automatically, which is very handy. All right, folks, I think that covers just about everything. There's obviously a number of other enhancements you could do to this game. You know, you could have a little, you could have a little hand that appears at the top holding it and it lets go and it drops down. You could have it drop down much faster by skipping a couple of frames. Uh, you could have it landing and then bouncing a little with maybe making a noise. There's all kinds of little things you could do. But um, that's basically how it works. That's how sprites work. And there's more you can do with sprites. This is just a basic introduction. Hope you enjoyed it and good luck with your own programming. <laughs>